It is National Dairy Month all month long here for the month of June. And so we thought, well, now, wouldn't it be fun to celebrate National Dairy Month by doing a little fact checking of the Dairy Council? Now, we did something similar not too terribly long ago with Big Beef. And so today we're going to look at the website for the Dairy Council. And we're going to pull that up right there. And to talk all about this, to do some fact checking with me today is dietitian Susan Levin from the Barnard Medical Center, as well as Dr. Neil Barnard himself. Uh, thank you both very much for being here today. Thank you, Chuck. Great to be here. I'm excited about this. You know, we, we got a lot of good feedback about our last segment uh, where we did fact checking from the beef website. And so, you know, it just struck me like, this is the time to do that for dairy. We get so many questions, uh, Dr. Barnard, you know this, when we do the exam room live, a lot of people are wondering about dairy because they've been told their entire life that dairy is really, really good for them. And of course, if you go to the Dairy Council website, you're going to see that they say that dairy is, in fact, one of the healthiest things you can possibly eat. But we also know that there is a growing amount of irrefutable evidence that says something quite to the contrary. So let's go through today and fact check it a little bit. And so if you want to play the the home game right now, you can head over to usdairy.com and play along with us. And I want to start, if you go up to the top, you go up, uh, to the menu that says Dairy Nutrition, and then you click right there on Dairy Facts. That brings you to the first screen that we will be tackling today. And then if you scroll down just a little bit, it's about the fourth thing down, and it asks the question, is milk good for you? So let's go ahead and click on that and see what it says. Of course, milk is good for you, it says. Uh, milk contains 13 essential nutrients like high quality protein, calcium, vitamin D, and more. Dietitian, though, Susan Levin, you've studied dairy extensively. Is milk, in fact, good for you? Let's go ahead and fact check this. What do you say to that? Well, I would start with your mother's milk is really good for you when you're nursing. So if you're a human baby, yeah, mother's milk, mother's uh, human mother's milk is the perfect food. So yes, but well, I think we all know that in this context, the dairy industry is not talking about your mother's milk. It is talking about a calf's mother. <laughs> so for the calf, yeah, it's a perfect food. For a human, no, because this is, um, you know, the top source of saturated fat in the American diet comes from dairy products. They didn't, they didn't quite mention that. It contributes to heart disease, type two diabetes, um, Alzheimer's disease, uh, and, and studies have linked dairy to increasing risk of cancers such as prostate cancer, breast cancer, ovarian cancer. So I'm gonna wrap up this, um, debunk this myth with the answer of no, no, cow's milk is not good for uh, humans. Let's talk about, yeah, go ahead, Dr. Bonner. If, if you don't mind, I, I want to jump in. I think, I think what Susan said is exactly right. And if you look at the near the top there, you see a, a bullet list of all the great things in, in milk. They say there's protein and calcium. But what they're leaving out is what is the most abundant nutrient in a glass of milk? Because it's not calcium and it's not protein. It's sugar, um, lactose sugar for which your body has no need whatsoever. That's number one. Right behind it is fat. That's number two. And as Susan mentioned, the main type of fat in it is saturated fat, which your body also doesn't need. So yeah, there's some protein and some calcium in there, but it's, um, it's in a vehicle that couldn't be more unhealthful. One of the things on this page also that uh, strikes me is it says uh, milk also contains B vitamins, which can help your body convert food, uh, food into fuel. And then it lists vitamin B12, B2, B5, B3. Um, Susan, true or false, these are all things that you can find without consuming dairy. Yeah, of course. You can get your B vitamins from all your plant foods. Um, B12 is the only exception. It is not made by plants or animals. It's made by bacteria. So in our modern hygienic um, diet, we would suggest someone who is following a completely plant-based diet to uh, take a B12 supplement. And there's a whole bunch of other groups of people in that category too. Anyone over the age of 50 needs a B12 supplement. Anyone taking certain medications, including antacids, have a history of taking antacids should take a B12 supplement. So it's not an unusual thing to supplement with, but um, that would be the only thing that you can't find 
in a plant product that has been properly washed. Let's jump back over to the dairy facts page. And right below the bullet for is milk good for you, you see the next question, which is does dairy cause inflammation? So let's go ahead and click on that. And right there at the top in big bold letters, it says evidence that dairy does not cause inflammation. Uh, again, gonna rely on your expertise here as a dietitian, Susan. What do you know about the connection between inflammation in the body and dairy consumption? Well, I would say that anyone who's ever had a reaction to dairy that includes um, a joint pain, uh, acne, <laughs> digestive issues, um, respiratory issues, sinus issues will tell you that dairy seems to be a pretty common pro-inflammatory product because this long list of reactions are not uncommon. It's actually quite common. Dairy is a, is a top allergen in our uh, food supply. So yeah, I would say that that's not true, that for many people, dairy is a clear pro-inflammatory product. And, and saturated then, fat, by the way, which Dr. Barnard mentioned, it's a top source, if not the top source of saturated fat in our diets. And saturated fat is in and of itself pro-inflammatory. And Dr. Barnard, I want to read this particular paragraph on the page to you and just get your, your uh, opinion of it. It says, when it comes to dairy specifically, a systematic review in the Journal of American College of Nutrition, funded by the National Dairy Council, evaluated 27 randomized control trials and found that dairy foods, i.e. milk and cheese and yogurt and dairy proteins, i.e. whey and casein, have neutral to beneficial effects on inflammation. So when I read that paragraph to you, what initially jumps off the screen to you? Well, there I, I think there are a couple things that should be said. Um, the different people have different responses. And so if a person has an inflammatory condition, um, by that I mean sore joints, rheumatoid arthritis, for example, or asthma, um, these are often very, very serious things. And I would run, don't walk to a completely dairy-free vegan diet, because you'll see for many, many people, they do get better. But the kind of review they're talking about is where you take every study ever done, and some of these studies were not intended to look at infl inflammation. They'll sometimes crunch the numbers together, and it's a good way to make real problems disappear when you mix good studies and bad studies together. So um, I, th I think the, the bottom line on this is that if a person has any kind of inflammatory condition, you want to try a dairy-free diet to see if it doesn't help you. All right, let's go back to the uh, dairy facts page here. Click on a couple of more. And uh, if you scroll down, you'll see another question on here. It says, does eating dairy foods lower your risk of type 2 diabetes and high blood pressure? So you click on that, and right at the top, uh, the first sentence says, new results from the Prospective Urban Rural Epidemiology Study, the PURE study, found that those who ate at least two servings of dairy a day compared to those who did not had a lower prevalence of metabolic syndrome and lower incidence of type 2 to diabetes and high blood pressure. Dr. Barnard, gonna jump to you for this one. Uh, what do you know, what, what studies have you seen that touch on dairy and diabetes and, and blood pressure? We, I have to say, we, we see, we've seen an interesting phenomenon, which is there are a number of studies who, if they're observational studies, it's not a randomized trial, but you just look at people who self-select their foods. There have been a number of them that show that the people who consume dairy seem to do better in certain ways. They're maybe uh, more likely to be uh, slim or, or that kind of thing. But then when you start dissecting it a little bit more, what you discover is that the reason in, in these observational studies or, or, or the, the benefit completely vanishes once you actually do a randomized trial. So why would you see it in an observational study but not in a controlled trial? The reason seems to be that in some of these observational studies, these are people who are trying to be health, they're health conscious people. They're trying to follow what they think is good advice. So they're exercising, they're eating moderate amounts, they're eating more vegetables and fruits, and they're having some low fat dairy because they heard that's good for them. Um, but the dairy isn't actually causing those benefits. Um, so it, it's, it's just sort of along for the ride. In studies like those that we have done, uh, where people have got diabetes and you're trying to help them to improve, um, what you discover is that, that getting the dairy out of the diet is part of uh, the solution to their diabetes. Because as Susan mentioned earlier, dairy is a huge source of bad fat, which is a big driver of insulin resistance. 
And here's the interesting thing. You just mentioned bad fat, though. But that paragraph uh, that, that we just read, it concludes with the association was stronger for those who ate full fat dairy foods. Um, that to me seems kind of interesting. And I guess if you interpret data, you can look at it any which way and, and kind of make it, you know, what you want it to say, uh, essentially. But uh, Dr. Barnard, as we've talked about ad nauseum here on the show, I mean, that connection between fat and diabetes, I mean, it is strong. It, it, it is strong, but you can make it disappear um, when you do research in a rather shoddy way um, by not doing a randomized trial and omitting <laughs> It, you will not see anywhere on the, the on the dairy websites the studies that speak against them, um, and so uh, when the pure study came out, it was hotly controversial at the time and has been ever since. Um, and and needless to say, the dairy industry has been choosing that study rather than the others. All right, let's click back over to the Dairy Facts page and scroll on down. And uh, we come to one close to the bottom that says, does milk contain vitamin D? And Susan, I want to jump back to you uh, here. I, I don't think that it takes a rocket scientist to say that, yes, milk contains vitamin D, but doesn't it contain vitamin D because it's been added? Yes. Very good, Chuck. So, yeah, milk um, is added in the factory like a, a lot of other products in that factory, they add hormones, they add growth factors linked to cancer, they add antibiotics because the animals are so sick, um, PCBs get in there and so do dioxins. So I, so is iodine because they use iodine to treat um, the wounds and the tears of the cow's udders from the whole process. So yeah, there's a lot of stuff in milk, whether it's added or comes with it. Um, that I would say makes it overall not an ideal product, certainly not for something that is naturally occurring in the sun or easily obtained from a supplement. And just for the record, there is no reliable dietary source of vitamin D. Those are not my words. Those are our government words. So you are going to have to turn to the sun or literally, or you're going to have to get it through a supplement anyway. You might as well skip the liquid that contains all those other things like growth factors and PCBs and dioxins and just get it from a much safer source. And Dr. Barnard, I believe that you've answered this on the exam room live before. We, we talk about getting vitamin D from the sun. How much sun should a person be getting to make sure that they're getting adequate levels? Uh, people would typically say that the commonly referred to amount is about 20 minutes on your face and arms every day. Now, needless to say, um, if you're getting that 20 minutes at the equator versus 20 minutes in North Dakota, um, the amount of ultraviolet light that causes the vitamin D to form will be somewhat different. But that's a, a pretty good rule of thumb because so many people are using sunscreen now. Um, the sunlight on your skin, which is mother nature source, may not be available. So if you're saying, all right, well, I'm not getting sunlight, maybe I should have my vitamin D from milk, the amount is not going to cover, cover you. Typically, for, for a great many people, you're gonna you're gonna want to have a supplement, and doctors would typically say about two thousand international units per day. So the, the dairy isn't gonna get you there. All right, let's go ahead and pull up another page here. So again, if you're playing along at home, you go over to usdairy.com and you click on the tab at the top for dairy nutrition. The first link that pops up underneath is for health and wellness. So you click on that and you come to a page that says health benefits of dairy. Uh, and they have it uh, kind of listed out here. They, they cover quite a few. Um, Susan, let's start with the one right at the top. They call dairy a quote, high quality protein. And then they go into dairy's benefits actually for post recovery workout. And I know that you have done a lot of studies when it comes to athletes and nutrition. And there have been a number of people who say chocolate milk is the best thing to drink after a workout. But does that argument hold any water? <laughs> um, no. First of all, as as a um, yeah, I'm a sports dietitian. So for what that's worth, uh, I at least can tell you that protein is not the primary fuel for an athlete. Carbohydrate is the primary fuel for an athlete. So that really should be more the discussion. So this whole high quality protein thing, it's like who is this person not getting enough protein and the protein that he or she getting is, is getting isn't of a high quality? Like it's, it's a made up problem that doesn't exist. So first of all, 
you know, we're focusing on the wrong nutrient here and there, there isn't a problem with that nutrient in the first place. So, uh, and, you know, no athlete or anyone else is running short on protein when they're getting enough calories. Um, and I always like, you know, in this topic, I love to defer to the athletes themselves, the professional athletes um, or, you know, athletes who train every day. And I, I have to give a plug or a shout out to switchforgood.org um, that made a whole nonprofit, a whole organization around this concept to debunk milk or dairies push on athletes to drink more of their products. And you hear testimony after testimony from these athletes in that organization, outside that organization that say over and you know, it's founder Dotsie Bausch, she was an Olympic um, biker, used words like, I felt extraordinary when I stopped drinking milk. It was magical. I, my, my performance improved drastically. Like, these are quotes from athletes who figured out that this whole campaign was not about improving their performance, but it was about lining the pockets of dairy industry. So I, I would turn to them. They have a whole scientific report on cow's milk and athletes. Um, this is a complete, this is a marketing campaign and it starts early. It starts in with non-professional athletes, elementary school, middle school, trying to get into the minds of kids to to make them think somehow you need this product to be a great athlete. It's very easy to trick kids into believing things like that when you put celebrities or certain phrases on a poster board. So I, I, I take great issue with the fact that they target kids um, who are susceptible to wanting to look or be like someone else and making it sound like their product does that when it absolutely does, for all the reasons we've already talked about like how could you have a product that is so harmful to your heart specifically and and say it's going to be good for athletes nothing that's bad for your heart is going to be good for performance or your health specifically your heart health and dr barnard let me come over to you for this particular sentence uh where they're talking about energy it says a growing body of research uh, supports the benefits of a higher protein diet not only for athletic and fitness performance but also for weight management and healthy aging now notice they said high protein diet right so that's not specifically dairy but when it comes to weight management when it comes to aging healthfully what do we know about a really high protein diet i'm assuming it's a high protein diet that's actually lower in carbohydrates that they're referring to. That's just my guess here. But what do you know about this inference here? Well, I think that is what they're saying. They're, they're saying that if in a short-term study, you remove all your carbohydrate and you eat a higher amount of protein, that you can lose weight from that. And the only reason you lose weight from that is because carbohydrate is about 50 or 60% of what most people eat. And so if you remove it, you're going to lose weight, but it's the most unhealthful way to, 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 to lose weight. Um, and, and speaking of the, sort of the healthfulness or the health risks of this, let me um, uh, second what Susan has just mentioned. The dairy industry has for a long time had really high paid strategists who figure out how to create a market for them as best they can. Now, as everybody knows, milk consumption has been flagging for a long time. And so they've been trying all kinds of things to try to prop it up. But they, one characteristic of, of their marketing methods is to appeal to youth. And they do it specifically because they figure if you hook somebody early or you get people thinking this is what you should do early in life, you've got a customer forever and ever. And so they will um, have sponsorships with high school teams and, and that kind of thing, promoting these beverages to try to, to appeal to what kids care about. But the concern is not just the short-term inflammatory conditions and so forth that are going to harm athletic performance. But the other concern is that because these kids are now drinking regular milk, chocolate milk, other dairy products, they're getting saturated fat in some of those products, and that's going to increase their cardiovascular risk over time. Uh, it's, it's, it sounds like somebody's getting some work done in the background there. Oh, um, sorry. We're doing construction here in the office, so let me mute while you ask your next question. Hopefully, they'll be done. Fair, fair enough. All right, Susan, uh, while he's muted, let's jump down to the next section on gut health. And this one talks a lot about fermented foods and probiotics mm -hmm. and how they contribute to good gut health. The last sentence in this one says, did you know probiotics can be found in some dairy foods like yogurt and kefir and help support gut health too? 
Um, but then we also know that there is this thing called lactose intolerance, right? And so if you eat dairy and you're lactose intolerant, you're going to have anything but good gut health. So when somebody says dairy is good for the gut, what do you say? <laughs> yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to, I could just, lactose intolerance is going to send me spinning off into <laughs> a different orbit. But let me just focus on the probiotic concept. This is kind of like the vitamin D concept. This is not something that is naturally occurring in the, the cow's milk you get on your shelf. No, this is something that's added at the factory into certain yogurt products. And whether it's plant-based or cow's uh, milk or whatever, Greek, you know, they're adding that into the container at the factory. Uh, if there's no reason you would need to consume that particular supplement, um, unless someone has, you know, there's some extraordinary reason, um, because, and here's why, if you're eating a healthy plant-based diet, uh, fiber is the natural foundation for a healthy gut biome. It is what ferments in your gut and makes that healthy environment. We're just, you know, we're just kind of on the cusp of learning all the effects that that healthy gut biome has on the rest of your body and, and health. Um, but we do know that when you build it from plants, naturally from fiber, um, that's all you need. You don't need all these supplements. You don't need the supplement um, necessarily in the bottle. And you certainly don't need it added to something like uh, dairy, which we know has all these other health risks um, in the in the factory. So yeah, you can, you can do it naturally. And you can even, if you're, if you want to eat more fermented foods that are naturally high in, in probiotics, that's fine. You can eat things like kimchi, um, which is made from cabbage or miso from soybeans, tempeh, uh, sauerkraut. There are other sources, natural sources of these types of probiotics and prebiotics even, but from plants is where you want to get them. Right. From plants, that's important. One of the things that gets talked about on the show in terms of good gut health, one of the things that Dr. Will Bolsowitz, the author of Fiber Fueled, stresses, he's like, look, eat as many different foods as possible, plant sources. But then somebody I, I think could be watching this right now and they're, they're still on the fence about a plant-based diet. They're like, well, if I'm supposed to eat a lot of different foods, right, and that is what really helps me have a healthy gut, well, what if I eat 12 different kinds of cheese? Aren't I getting that diverse glut, gut flora there? Wouldn't that be helpful, Susan? Um, no. First of all, cheese is completely devoid of um, fiber, which is that natural building of this healthy, healthy gut biome. And again, even though we're on the kind of the early years of learning about gut health, we, we do know that when it's formed, it does seem, it appears that the gut biome that is grown from these plant-based sources versus a gut biome that is um, fed by more of a Western diet or a high animal product diet. The plant one is so much more health healthful and it seems to then translate into healthier um, outcomes in other areas like chronic disease risk. So again, on the verge of discovering this, but you're not gonna get that with, <laughs> you're not gonna get that healthy gut biome from um, cheese and you know and you're certainly not going to live a healthy holistic life if you're fueling anything with cheese because cheese is so unhealthy all right let's scroll down to the next uh thing on there dr barnard uh how's the sound in your background are, are we back are we wait for um we can try i'll tell you the the elves upstairs are are <laughs> renovating our entire building so you can't hear them now but they, they may come in but let's get let's give it a shot see if we can have it see if we can have another question Fair enough. The next thing on the uh, on the page here you see is immunity. OK, and they say eating dairy foods as part of an overall healthy diet is one of the ways to get the nutrients you need for normal immune function. For instance, milk contains vitamins A and D, protein, selenium and zinc, which are important to normal immune function. Cheese and yogurt also contain protein and yogurt is a good source of zinc, too. Dr. Barnard, do you need dairy in order to have a healthy immune system? You need all of those nutrients, but they are all available in healthier sources. You don't need dairy, and dairy would be the last place I'd go for this. Um, there have been a number of studies that have looked at things that seem to interfere um, with immunity, and one of the things that does that is is a fatty diet, particularly saturated fat. So, you know, I, you do need protein, but plant proteins are, are going to be far better from the standpoint of having a good, healthy body. 
All right, Susan, I'm going to come to you for the next one. And this is this is one I honestly was not expecting to see on their website. Uh, it says uh, under the health benefits of dairy, calming. Calming is listed as one. It said the science is well established in that in general, protein is more satiating than the same amount of carbohydrate or fat. And this can contribute to feeling more satisfied, which could possibly help you sleep a little bit better. Uh, Susan, when somebody makes the claim that dairy will help you sleep better, what say you? <laughs> well, I guess if feeling kind of sick and sluggish is the same as being sleepy, maybe. I mean, that one just seemed like such a stretch. I, I couldn't really wrap my head around that particular uh, claim. <laughs> but I mean, as, as far as I know, and we have actually, Chuck, we have a great fact sheet on this. It's called Food and Mood. It's um, on our resource page. I'm sure you tell listeners all the time where to find things. But there's, there's a great description of how it's, it's the opposite. <laughs> like the car, the complex carbohydrates, which you're not going to find in a dairy product, but the complex carbohydrates are actually what lead to increased um, serotonin. And when you have sufficient serotonin, you have more feelings of, of, of well-being, calmer, less depression, better sleep. And you're going to get that with a diet that's high in the vegetables, the beans, the grains, the fruits. So quite the opposite in terms of the research. Um, I'm aware, and I didn't see them referencing anything. I think, that, I don't know where they decided to make that claim, but again, the only thing I could come up with was, I guess if you feel sick, sick you might want to take a nap, but that was about as far as I could get. Uh, uh, let, me, yeah. let me jump in on that just real quick. Um, there are actually mild opiates in dairy products, and I'm sorry to say there have been some hideous experiments where they show mm -hmm. that if you, if you give these to, very, to frightened animals, they seem to calm down. Um, they're called casomorphins, and they're designed to, to calm the calf. So that could be what they're talking about. Um, the last thing you want. Right, Absolutely. and why it's so addictive, right? Because you crave those opiates. Well, you don't even, your brain craves those opiates. You need your fix. I know. And, and how often, Susan, as a dietitian, do you have somebody come into your office and say, well, hey, I could go 100% vegan, but I just can't give up cheese. Cheese. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Because of what Dr. Barnard mentioned, these uh, it's important for a calf to not logically crave mom's milk, but biologically crave it. Right. So you need those opiates. You need those drugs. Same for human babies with human milk, but um, not something we need to be uh, addicted to as past weaning. All right, let's go ahead and jump over to the dairy nutrition page. So just go ahead and click right at the top there where it says dairy nutrition on the website. And then you scroll right on down and they start to list some stuff. And then uh, for dietary guidance, right? They say uh, dairy foods are part of the uh, dietary guidelines and thus are linked to quote, a reduced risk of chronic disease. Now, this is something, Susan, that we've touched upon a little bit here uh, today, but I'm curious about the link between dairy and chronic disease. Is there actually a correlation here between a reduction in chronic disease, or do you know something other than what it is Big Dairy here is saying? Well, I think that it's, it's important to remember who drafts the dietary guidelines for Americans, which is what they are referencing here. And the co-owner in that project is our very own U.S. Department of Agriculture, whose job is to promote um, and make sure you, America, um, are consuming lots and lots of dairy. So what they're not going to do is mention to you, to us, or explain to us what dairy actually brings to the table, including that high um, source of saturated fat, cholesterol. However, what they do do is reduce it down and say, you don't wanna consume a lot of saturated fat or a lot of cholesterol. Um, biologically, you need zero, so just keep it to a minimum, but then they go on to just dairy, dairy, dairy all the time. Um, and yes, they don't. They fail to mention the link between dairy, it's, it's um, it loads of saturated fat that it carries with it and chronic disease risk with saturated fat and dietary cholesterol. So no, <laughs> dairy is not going to be linked to, it's not going to cause a reduction in chronic disease risk. And in fact, we know that there's an association between dairy and 
conditions, cancer, certain cancers, hormone related cancers, specifically like prostate, breast and ovarian cancers. Um, so they are conveniently overlooking that. And I would really just put, you know, the only word that comes to mind when I see something like that is, oh, marketing. Like they're just very good at marketing their product. Um, that's that's what they do. And unfortunately, that's kind of what the dietary guidelines do as well. The next part of that paragraph under dietary guidelines talks about dairy for prenatal and maternal health and says that yogurt and cheese are recommended as complementary foods to human milk or iron fortified formula beginning at age six months. Six months is when uh, they're saying to introduce your baby to uh, dairy. Um, you, I believe, have raised a 100% plant-based child. Uh, came up happy, healthy without dairy? Uh, it's true. And I don't even think I'm the only one. <laughs> There's plenty of people out there who've raised their children either completely plant based or just dairy free. I mean, to a lot of people who read <laughs> or look into this information, they know how scary uh, cow's milk can be on human health. And we tend to that awareness tends to be heightened when you talk about feeding your child. So to feed your child cow's milk and you know the diet these recommendations will mention to you you should never give your kid milk before the age of one because your digestive the digestive tract just isn't um rigid enough to keep out those harmful proteins that could basically destroy a kid's health um they don't mention that so much but to me like yogurt and cheese have the same you know come from cow's milk so to me it's like I don't know why you'd be putting any of this into a child's body who can't even, who can barely handle, um, you know, foreign or, or solid foods to begin with. Um, plus, we know that dairy products decrease the absorption of iron, and iron is really the reason why you feed a kid at six months is because he or she has depleted all of his iron stores that brought over with the placenta. Like, there's a whole thing. So this, to me, is, again, just marketing. They have... Dairy is so good, big dairy is so good at finding out where every customer potential is, every crack, every crevice. They will look in and be like, hold on, there's a whole lot of babies in this world and we need them to be consuming this product. Um, they, they will find, they will target them and they will make sure that they are getting their product into those bodies <laughs> because again, it's, it's marketing, it's money for them. But you know, Susan, that said, it's not really working for them because year after year after year, milk consumption has declined True. Um, with one exception, and that's cheese. Um, the cheese is the one product where it's just kind of off the scale, um, gone way, way up. So the, the, they are very aggressive, just as you said, and, and very creative with a milk mustache and all these things. Um, very clever, really uh, entered into our consciousness. But by and large, people don't want that product anymore. Uh, they're, they're getting more and more away from it. And then partly that's because when you look at the dairy case, it's not dairy anymore. There's almond milk, there's soy milk, there's rice milk, there's hemp milk, there's oat milk, all of which are, are healthier choices. And then uh, it says, uh, not just introducing whole milk at six months, it goes on to say that plain reduced fat yogurt and reduced fat cheese should be introduced in appropriate servings beginning at 12 months to 23 months. Again, Susan and Dr. Barnard, the same things that we were just talking about, I would assume those same principles apply here. Yeah, and there's, there's just no biological need for this at all. So the fact that they got got into the dietary guidelines at all is is disturbing enough it's um it's almost just like a habit so they just threw it in there because well people are habituated to doing this so we're just going to condone it and endorse it because hey we make a lot of money off of this but there's absolutely no biological reason for any of these recommendations much less um benefit <laughs> so you know marketing and Dr. Barnard, um, the last thing on their website that I wanted to touch on, I'm just going to read this verbatim to you, and I would love to get your reaction. This is under lactose intolerance, okay? And they write, uh, lactose intolerance can be a barrier to dairy consumption and can put people at risk of not getting the nutrition their bodies need. But... 
The good news is that living with lactose intolerance doesn't mean you have to give up your favorite dairy foods. Did you know that each person with lactose intolerance is likely able to tolerate varying degrees of lactose? It's all about understanding how much lactose is in the foods you love and how much you can handle at once. So yeah, Dr. Barnard, your reaction to that paragraph. Um, lactose intolerance um, is not a disease. It's a normal condition. And this is something that really wasn't understood until about 1965, when people started testing large groups of people and they started to discover that, that lactose intolerance, the getting indigestion after drinking milk, is actually the biological norm for humans and also for every other mammal. Why, why would it be that way? Well, if you drink milk from your mom, from your mother's breast, um, that's appropriate nutrition for an infant's body, but it's not appropriate for you when you're seven years old or, or, or longer. So the body discards the enzyme, the lactase enzymes that allow you to digest the milk sugar. They're just gone. Um, and nature is glad they're gone because if you could continue to digest it, you would put yourself at risk of all the conditions that come from this high fat hormone laden product. Um, so the natural, uh, the natural condition is lactose intolerance. And the idea is not to defeat it, but to respect it. It's a sign that you're not supposed to be drinking milk anymore um, at your age. And there's no reason to ever drink the milk from a different species. That's, that's nature. And, you know, let's kind of wrap up this segment here, this fact checking segment with this question. And Dr. Barnard, again, we'll start with you. Um, they talked a lot about the benefits of dairy and you hinted at this a little bit earlier, but it seems like a lot of these uh, health facts about dairy seem to omit a lot of facts. What do you think uh, they should be adding to their website to make it a little bit more, I don't know, on the up and up? At Harvard University did two major studies that clearly showed that prostate cancer was much more common in dairy drinking men than men who avoided dairy products. And we understand that when men drink uh, milk products, their body makes more IGF-1, insulin-like growth factor that can stimulate the growth of prostate cancer cells. Um, many other studies since then have addressed this. And the answer is reasonably clear that having more milk in your diet or dairy products in general increases the risk of prostate cancer, one of, one of the most common forms of cancer. Last year, about a year ago, the Adventist Health Study 2 came out with really frightening findings saying it's not just prostate cancer, breast cancer, uh, significantly increased even from rather modest amounts of dairy. Why would that be? Because dairy products come out of a cow. The cows are artificially inseminated. They're impregnated every year on every dairy, wherever your, your milk or ice cream or sour cream or yogurt came from. And then Everybody knows about this because they're, they, the cows are impregnated and their calves are taken away and slaughtered for veal if they're males and then they're kept in isolation if they're females. So that has troubled people for ethical reasons. But the biological issue is when they're impregnated annually and they're milked well into their pregnancy as they are on every dairy, you're getting a lot of estrogen in your milk. So your seven-year-old daughter is now drinking estradiol and your eight-year-old son is drinking estradiol in milk or eating it in cheese. Uh, they don't want to put that on the website because you wouldn't buy it if they told you that there are hormones in the cow because we're milking her during her pregnancy. So all that stuff should should be sh should factor in the decision making that people pe people arrive at, which is to leave the dairy off. And Susan, uh, final question goes to you. Uh, is there anything else that you think uh, should be up on that website that uh, <laughs> that they have not yet gotten around to putting it up? Yeah, I mean, I think it bridges kind of the lactose intolerance um, issue along with um, what Dr. Barnard is saying about the cancer risk. Uh, Lactose intolerance being the natural defense system <laughs> warning us not to consume this product, whether from our mother or any species, obviously, past a certain age, or there could be consequences. And unfortunately, the consequences that Dr. Barnard mentioned, bad as they are, are worse for people of color, specifically research showing that black men have higher rates of prostate cancer and are more likely to die from it than their white counterparts. Um, black women are more likely to die of ovarian cancer. And, and again, and, and 
breast cancer. And these are cancers that are associated, as Dr. Barnard said, with consuming dairy. So where is that other than their attempt, again, to attract the majority of planet, which is lactose intolerant, to drink their product anyway? So you're not only disproportionately targeting people of color who are disproportionately affected by the diseases that dairy actually causes, it's a it's it's a it's a double whammy, which seems kind of like a light word to use for what is just careless, heartless, thoughtless um, dietary recommendations that have deadly consequences, and more so for communities of color. All right. Well, Susan, Dr. Barnard, I want to wish uh, both of you a happy National Dairy Month. I guess. I don't know. Uh, but uh, thank you. Uh, thank you both so very much for taking some time out of your day to help us do uh, some important fact checking here. Uh, greatly, greatly, greatly appreciate it. Thank you so very much. If your health IQ is a couple of points higher than it was a few minutes ago, go ahead and like this video or subscribe to the YouTube channel. And to take it even higher, head over to Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your favorite shows. Look for the exam room by the Physicians Committee. Hit the subscribe button there as well and help to make your world a healthier place.